Welcome back as we move to session 40 in our study of spiritual gifts. This session we'll be looking at clarifying similar spiritual gifts. And we welcome those of you in the classroom as we continue our uh, journey together. In the last session we studied 1 Corinthians 14 verses 26 to 40. And in this section Paul laid out some very clear guidelines for the Corinthian church to follow to make sure that they had orderly worship. There's one section where Paul is very clear and very adamant about how women should participate in the church. His view is that women should not speak, that women, in fact, it's disgraceful for them to speak, and that they should ask their husbands at home if they have any questions. We talked about how there's differing views on that. Some believe that's true for all time. Others believe it was only for the Corinthian church and others believe that it was a cultural bias that changes as the times change. In this session, we're not going to go to any particular Bible passage. We have completed our study of spiritual gifts. And now as we've moved across those 21 gifts, there have been times where I know you have wondered, how is that gift different from that gift? They sound an awful lot alike. And so I wanted to spend a session trying to provide some clarity on how these gifts are distinct from one another. It's important to start with an understanding of spiritual gifts. First, they are not our abilities. It's not what we do well. And then the Holy Spirit comes and takes our abilities that are our strengths, somehow gives them supernatural power, and boom, they're used for the church. In fact, it is the Holy Spirit who is revealing Himself as He works through us. We become the conduit, the channel for Him to do work in the lives of other people. Much like when you plug in something to the wall for electricity, the electricity flows through the plug and then it goes to the appliance or whatever else is plugged in. We are the, are the plug, the cord. The power is the Holy Spirit, and the appliance is the person benefiting from what the Spirit is doing. The second thing to understand is that while we want to be clear about what the spiritual gifts are and how they are distinguished from each other, how they're different and how they're similar, the most important thing is that people are served through the spiritual gift. So when you get to a point where you go, was that healing or was that miracles? That's more of an academic question than anything else. The important thing is somebody was benefited. They became whole again. Their hand was healed. They could walk again. Was it a miracle? Of course. Was it a healing? You bet. It was both of them. So let's not get caught up in this trying to make sure we understand exactly what it is. But it is helpful to see how these work together and in working together we'll have a better understanding of how they are different and how they must work together as the body must work together. I'm going to give you a scenario. That is, I'm going to give you a situation that might happen in a church and then I'm going to try to explain how several gifts would come alongside, work together to accomplish work for the church. All of these have to do with managing the church. There is a church that on the second floor, in the back, there is a very large storage room. And they store a lot of equipment and supplies and materials that they need throughout the year. They have things that are in the back that they bring out for Christmas and they put on display. There are other items that they use for Easter, and there are a variety of uh, materials that are only used at a certain portion of the time. Well, the pastor was walking there one time, and suddenly he stopped and said, maybe we could use this room for our student ministry center. The high school group, the junior high group, the college group, they had very cramped quarters downstairs. And while the pastor was walking through the room, the thought came to him, maybe we could transform this room into a place 
that the students could call their own. They could put couches in there and make themselves comfortable. Over there they could have like a microwave and a refrigerator and have a place for some food. And, and over there they could have the stage where music could be played. And it's so far away from everything else, the young people would feel like it was their own place. That it wasn't a place where mom and dad were at, it was a place that belonged to them. That's the gift of leadership. And so the pastor comes away and he starts talking about it with the staff. I was upstairs and I was walking through the storage room and the thought came to me, what a wonderful place for us to have the Student Ministry Center. And as he talked about it, people went, I never thought of that. You know, you're right, we probably could take all that stuff and we could put it in a storage uh, bin that is in the local community where you can put, you can rent a space and put storage and then we'll only get it when we need it. My pastor, that's a pretty good idea. And so people start getting excited about it. And then the pastor talks to the person in the church who is the executive pastor. This is a person in many churches who actually makes things happen in the church. And the executive pastor had the gift of administration. And so he talked with the pastor, understood exactly what he had in mind, and he said, all right, let me see what I can do. So he sat down, he made a list. All right, what do we have to do to make this happen? I've got to get a storage place. I've got to clean all that stuff out. Uh, we're going to need some furniture and a microwave. And of course, we'll have to do some painting. And we're going to need some uh, people to come in who are workers to do this. So he makes up a list. And then he tries to organize it in a chronological order. And he sits down and goes, OK, now if we get the paint, that'll probably cost about that amount. And this will cost that. All right, the whole project will probably cost this amount. All right, now I'm going to start here. In this month, we'll do this. And then in this month, okay, we've done that. Now we'll do this. And then by the time we get to the first of the year, I think it will be done. In other words, the administrator takes the idea and develops the plan to make it happen. You'll remember that we said that the leader has the vision. They choose the destination, but it's the administrator who pilots the ship and makes sure that the ship arrives at the destination. In this story, the destination is having a brand new place for the ministry for students to come and call their own. And the pastor had the idea, the vision, but he didn't work out all the details. Instead, the person with the gift of administration came up with the plan but then a person comes alongside the administrator with the gift of helps. And this person then, as the plan has been completed, volunteers and says, why don't I make some phone calls for you and I'll find out where is the best place that we can get a good price for paint. And I'll call a few people and see if they're willing to help us out and on a Saturday, we'll move over things to the storage area. And I'll, I'll check with the storage area to see is there space available and how much that will cost. In other words, the gift of helps, they take on the practical things that have to be done in order to make the project happen. So that instead of the administrator having to pick up the phone and call you know, seven places to find out where can I get the best price, the person with the gift of helps frees that person up to be able to accomplish the original vision. And so one day, in the beginning of the year, the church celebrated the grand opening of the Student Ministry Center. It was a combined project of many people. The pastor who had the idea, the administrator who made things happen, and the person with the gift of helps who did all of the tasks and errands that needed to be done that freed up the administrator and the pastor to do the work of ministry. This is the church in action. This is each of us having a different part to play to make sure that the church works smoothly. Much like the body works, where our nerve system says, oh, that's hot, and it travels up the nerve system to the brain, and the brain gets the message, that's hot, and tells 
the arm, move out of the way. Everybody did their part and everybody must do their part to make it happen. Those are some gifts that often are confused. Leadership and administration. Leadership, they come up with the idea. They have the, the sense that there's something better that we could do that would make uh, it better for the church. Why are we using that for storage when the students need it for ministry? We could take that stuff and move it over there in a storage bin. And the, the administrator makes it happen then. And the person with the gift of helps supports them both. It's a team effort. In the body of Christ, none of us works alone. We always work with other people to accomplish the work of ministry. Now I have another situation for you that will show the difference between two other gifts. The pastor was looking over a list of uh, how many people had come to the church over the past month and where they lived, what communities they had come from. And he noticed something unusual. There were a large number of people that were coming from another village that was quite a distance from where the church is located. It took them about 45 minutes to get to the place. And he thought, this is really unusual. We've got all these people over there who seem to like our church and they're willing to drive all that distance. Why don't we, why don't we start a church over in that community? And they'll be a sister church to us and we'll work together. And the programs we have will be very, very similar to the programs they have. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. And so naturally, he needs some help. He can't do it on his own. He has a responsibility to preach and to uh, shepherd and to go to the hospital and greet people. So he goes to a person in his church with the gift of apostleship. And he said, I think we should start a church over in that village. And I want you to take the responsibility to make sure that that church gets started. But I want to tell you something before you get started. What you do matters. And if you drop the ball, if you don't make it happen, a lot of people are going to be hurt. And I'm depending on you. Because that's what a leader does. They challenge, they encourage, they confront, and they put out there a little bit of a challenge saying, I know you can do it. But if you don't, it's going to really hurt. So now go do it. And the person's a little more, you know, energized to get it done. So the apostle goes and meets with some of the people from that uh, village who are attending his church. And they have a meeting and they talk about the possibility of having a new church. And some people are not excited about that idea. They like coming to this church, but there's others who say, Boy, that's 45 minutes to this church and then another 45 minutes back. That's an hour and a half that I could free up on a Sunday to do other things. If there was a church right by my house, think of all the, the time I would save. And then when I bring my children to their things at church, I wouldn't have to drive all the way over there or I wouldn't decide they're not going to it because it's just too, too inconvenient. Good idea. So now he identifies the apostle. A few people from that area who seem to be really interested and they're key influencers. They're the ones who can start talking it up with other people and getting other people involved and excited. And pretty soon they have a whole group who is interested in starting a church and they begin making plans for this church. And they have someone with the gift of administration who comes alongside and makes all the plans. And a person with the gift of helps who comes alongside and says, let me help you do that. And someone with the gift of teaching who says, I'm interested in starting the Sunday school there. And someone else who has the gift of evangelism who says, and I would love to begin our outreach program at the church. And before you know it, instead of one church, you have two churches who are serving God. 
And they're very similar churches. In fact, this church was launched from this church. In a sense, this church gave birth to the new church. And so the church expands, more people are served, and God is glorified. How did it happen? Person with leadership saw potential, a possibility, a maybe. Hmm, that could be a good idea. And then cast the vision to his person who had the gift of apostleship, who saw it, and who, being an apostle, loves going out and taking on a task and beginning new things. And then, as that person began talking with others, people came alongside with other gifts that were going to be needed at the new church, and pretty soon the church is underway and it's operating and you have two churches instead of one. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the Kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. So I think those scenarios may help clarify those gifts. Administration, uh, leadership, apostleship, helps. Sometimes a few of those gifts are mixed up. But one of uh, two gifts that are often mixed up, I'm not going to give a scenario. I'm just going to try to explain the differences between the two. You may have thought, what's the difference between encouragement and mercy? They seem an awful lot alike that aren't you showing mercy to somebody when you encourage them and when you show mercy to them, aren't they encouraged? How, how are the two different? Well, encouragement is when a believer senses that someone is beginning to wander away from the faith. They're sensitive to the fact that maybe someone has not been coming to church and it's been for about a month and they wonder, huh, I wonder what's wrong. And so they make a telephone call. Hey, I haven't seen you at church. Is everything okay? No, no, my wife is sick and you know, I just, I don't know. It just has been so hard. I just don't feel like going to church. Everything seems to be going wrong. How about if I come over and we just sit down and have some coffee and talk about it? And then that person goes over and they spend time building a relationship with this individual. And they show them through their behavior, you're not a project to me. You're a person and I really feel for you. I can imagine what it would be like if your spouse was really sick and how that would disrupt the home and how that would make you less interested in wanting to get all the kids together on a Sunday and, and go to church. This is really, really tough, I know. And after walking with that person and spending time and doing things, being a great listener and without offering a lot of advice, but just being there. You know, how about if I take your kids for a while and, and maybe you could go off and see a, uh, uh, something at the theater. Just get out and enjoy yourself and I'll, I'll be with the kids. So they're encouraging them. But at some point, they're going to stop and say, you know, this has been going on for about two months or so and I know it's hard. But the Bible says, do not neglect the gathering together of yourselves. We are to come together. I'd sure like you to come to church. How about if I swing by on Sunday and I'll pick you up and the kids and we'll all go to church together? Yeah, oh, okay. And, and your wife will be fine. She'll just be sleeping and we'll bring her you know, kids back when uh, the service is done. Maybe it'll be a nice break for her. And before long, that person is starting to come back into the mainstream and feeling a little more a part of things. And why? Because somebody cared. Somebody exercised their gift of encouragement, saw somebody who was in danger of moving away, pulled them back into the church. Now, there are some similarities with somebody who has the gift of mercy, but there are also some differences. Similarities are, it's an individual they're working with, 
and that they care deeply for that person, that they feel for that person. The difference is, is that that person is going through a hardship themselves and that they have had an accident. And as a result of that accident, they're out of work. And out of work, they don't have money. And since they don't have money, they don't have food. And they're in danger of losing the place they live. And it goes on and on and on. And the person with mercy, like the Good Samaritan, comes along and they make sure that the needs are met. They make sure that the church provides some food to help this from the church food pantry. And they make sure that the mortgage is paid for and that the church benevolence helps out. And they are there with the individual to try to help that person find another job. That is mercy. The person themselves is injured, hurt, harmed, and you come alongside and you try to provide specifically for their needs. It isn't that they're wandering away from the church. It's just something bad has happened to them. And now you want to help them. I experienced this with people after my wife died. You know, when she passed away, for the first two weeks, there were people in my house all the time. I mean, they were dropping off food and casseroles and can I take your kids? And, you know, they were there and calls. Two weeks afterwards, it kind of dropped away. You know, other people started suffering losses and so now the attention goes there and, and my loss was kind of in the back seat of the car. It wasn't quite as visible, except to the few people I knew with the gift of mercy who would still come over and instead of saying, how are you? Because after all, what am I going to say? How are you? Oh, I'm fine. Things are going really well. They're not. I've just lost my wife. Instead, they'd come in, throw their arms around me and said, I'm so sorry that you're going through this. I just want you to know I love you and I'm going to be there for you. That's the gift of mercy. Those are the people who get it. They get it that people are going through a hard time and they need somebody to care for them, to be with them, and to provide for their immediate needs because they have suffered a loss. Not in danger of wandering from the church, but in danger of just giving up on life because things are too hard. So hopefully that distinguishes between those two. Encouragement, someone wandering away, bring them back. Mercy, somebody personally suffering a loss uh, in pain, uh, experiencing hardship, and you meet their specific needs. Then let's go to two other gifts that I know you're confused about because I get confused about it, which is why I taught you in the beginning Sometimes it just doesn't matter which gift it is. The important thing is that people were served, that the Holy Spirit worked through you and touched people's lives. Healings tend to be healing physically, emotionally, mentally, relationally, spiritually. It's not just somebody's had a tumor in their arm and now it's gone. That would be a physical healing. It's someone went through a divorce and their pain is enormous and someone comes along with the gift of healing to help them come back emotionally and regain kind of uh, stability in their emotions so that they can move on. Or it might be spiritually that the person is struggling with some issue with God and they're able to help work it through and explain it in a way that makes sense to the person. Miracles, however, typically are visible, physical uh, acts that defy explanation. They are things that occur that should not be able to occur given the laws of physics. And as a result, people can only say, God did that. I don't know how that happened. God did that. Healings benefit the church and they benefit the church so that others can hear the gospel. Somebody is healed in the church, 
my friend uh, Mieko, whose tumor was gone. Well, now people heard that and many came to Christ. Miracles is when somebody does something that absolutely violates human nature. It should not have happened. It was so incredible that it makes no sense whatsoever. A person says, in the name of Jesus Christ, you're going to die. Because you have defied Jesus Christ, you will experience death. And they drop dead. We've seen that in scripture before. That would be a miracle. It shouldn't happen that way. Yeah, people die, but not because somebody says you're going to die. That's a miracle. It defies the laws of human nature, and the only person you can attribute it to is God himself. So healings, a variety of healings, typically benefiting people within the church as a way of sharing the gospel with others. Miracles, something that takes place for which there is no human explanation how that could have occurred. And the only person who could have done it is God, and it's assigned to unbelievers to come to Christ. One last uh, distinction between gifts, and then we'll close. There's sometimes some confusion about knowledge and wisdom. Which is knowledge, wisdom is wisdom. Knowledge comes down to facts, knowing facts knowing information. Wisdom is applying information to a situation. I have the gift of knowledge. I have a pool of information about Bible verses, stories, illustrations, analogies, charts, that over the years God has kind of worked into my, my mind and stored there that the Holy Spirit can pull out and use in a particular situation. But it's just, I have those facts. And those facts suddenly come to mind in a certain situation, the Spirit uses it. Wisdom is when someone comes to you and says, I'm not sure what to do, what do you think? And you are able to take biblical principles and tell them, on the basis of what you said, I think you should stop dating that person. She's not a Christian. And the person stops dating. They see it from God's perspective and they tell the other person, this is what I think God would have you do. It's where you take information that you know about the Bible and you share it and apply it as a principle in that person's life. A person drinks alcohol and they're struggling with alcohol and they're refusing to believe that they're an alcoholic. And they continue to go to the Bible and say, but God does not say that you can't drink alcohol. He says, don't get drunk with wine. And I'm not doing that. And the person says, really? Well, you're right. The Bible does say, you can drink if you want to. And I know some churches disagree. But it says, don't get drunk. Where were you last night? Well, I mean, I stayed at, uh, at the um, local tavern and I was there with some friends. But I made it home. Really? What time did you get home? Oh, it was about 3 o'clock in the morning. Huh. And pretty soon that person begins to see that there's a biblical principle that they're violating and that there's a different course that their life should take. We say, if you have the gift of wisdom, you will know it because many people will come to you for advice. Nobody comes to me for knowledge. Nobody says, you know, Steve, you really know a lot of stuff. Tell me. Come on, lay it on me. Tell me all the good stuff you know. Instead, I have it stored away and God pulls it out at the moment it's needed. But with wisdom, people seek you out. People come to you and want you to explain, what do I do? Why am I struggling? Or they don't realize they're struggling and they come to you and you help them see that they are.